Dear students, ladies and gentlemen, respected guests, this is going to become again a great evening at this wonderful your university. Welcome to all of you first, and thanks for coming. I know you have been selected out of more than 2,000 applications, and I feel sorry for all the others. We could uh, not let in. A thousand people are in the audience, and uh, you now share and witness an extraordinarily famous um, man, the right honorable Tony Blair, the former prime minister of Great Britain. Let us welcome him. Tony Blair has several things in common with us. Edinburgh, Oxford, and London. He was born and raised in Edinburgh. They're having an outstanding university, and because of that, this university is a close partner to TUM, of course. <laughs> and the same happens to be true for Oxford. Uh, he studied not engineering. Law science, but the world needs lawyers too. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully not too many. You know? But he got an excellent lawyer, and uh, so soon he entered politics. His uh, enormous charisma uh, made him uh, probably the finest opposition leader his country had for a long time, and so there was little surprise that by means of a landslide majority, he became, uh, in the elections in 97, he became the youngest Labour Prime Minister of Great Britain ever. And finally, London. London is the place where Imperial College has made rumors all over the world, and uh, we just entered a flagship partnership with this outstanding technical university in Great Britain on the island. Um, we have an almost perfect match of disciplines with imperial, medicine, life science, engineering, science, management, and they are also quite strong in entrepreneurship. Actually, they say they want to learn something entrepreneurship from us, but uh, certainly there's other disciplines where they are stronger than we. So we perfectly match in our goals, and uh, in signing this partnership, we also want to send a signal to Europe that Europe is a common idea, uh, and we need the uh, unity of Europe for a better world and for a better science and for better engineering, uh, dear students. So always think about that Europe is our future. And uh, it, I'm, I'm very grateful to you, Mr. Blair, that you, that you came and that you are willing uh, to share a discussion on the connection uh, of uh, Europe, the European Union, with great Britain. I think uh, this is of utmost uh, importance to our young people, what uh, you uh, will be saying. Uh, I would like to thank our students, however, uh, who initiated the famous speaker series. Um, before you came, we had uh, people like uh, Kofi Annan, uh, we had Bill Gates uh, in this room, so all these celebrities of the world, and uh, once again, thanks, you came. Uh, on behalf of uh, several well-known guests um, in the audience, I also would say a cordial welcome uh, to our honorary senator, Mrs. Clutton, Susanne Clutton. Welcome. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, I, first of all, she's, she's a wonderful lady. And uh, she, has been in our, she has been in our board of trustees for a long time. Uh, she has been supporting this university also for quite some time. Uh, the Unternehmertum GmbH she started. Uh, and also she helped us uh, to uh, charter the TUM School of Education, a better teacher's education to which we are committed as a public university uh, of technology. Thanks for all these donations and gifts uh, and for uh, the support you have been giving us ever since. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's uh, your turn, Silja Wörle. She is a member of the great uh, organizing team of the TUM Speakers Series. Uh, she is uh, now entering the stage in order to say a few data and informations uh, and secrets maybe of uh, Tony Blair's Vita. Thank you. Decoding politics in the age of Brexit. That's why we are here today. In June 2016, the British citizens decided to leave the European Union, followed by an intense two-year negotiation phase. In November 2018, the British government and the European Union found their consent in a withdrawal agreement. This agreement, however, was rejected by the House of Commons by a wide margin in January 2019. Yesterday, the British government suffered another Commons defeat. For quite some time now, we are living in a state of great uncertainty. But furthermore, there is a lack of understanding. We, the Europeans, love to visit the UK. We are fascinated by the culture and especially the patience to stand in a queue. Thus, we are shocked and uh, don't understand why the Britons want to leave us. In order to shed light upon this and to discuss the future of the United Kingdom and the European Union, we're happy to welcome Tony Blair as our guest today. Tony Blair has served as British Prime Minister for 10 years. Afterwards, he was appointed the official envoy of the Quartet on the Middle East and worked in the private sector as investment advisor. Simultaneously, he founded multiple charities that were consolidated in 2016 under the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Dear ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Tony Blair. First of all, thank you to the here. Open your water, feel free. <laughs> yeah. Okay, before we start uh, with the topic of Brexit, thank you very much, um, I want to talk with you about the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. So one of your main goals of the Institute is to counteract increasing uh, the popularity of populism, especially authoritarian populism. What advices would you give national governments to achieve that goal? Okay, so yeah, first of all, um, thank you very much for having me at, at TUM. Uh, congratulations on everything that the university is doing and with the Imperial College connection and uh, my apologies for having read law and not engineering. Uh, <laughs> actually, it would, it would be better if I had read engineering to be absolutely <laughs> frank, but uh, it's great to come to an institution which is of such high academic and practical esteem. So um, my institute really d works around the theme of how you make globalization work for people. So my view is that a lot of the populism is a reaction against globalization. 
But I think globalization in the end is a, is a force that's driven by people and not by government. And the real challenge is how we make the best use of it and how we make it a force for justice and not just for additional wealth. So this is what the Institute works on. And in respect of populism, my advice to governments would be today to deal with the anxieties that people have, which are driving things like Brexit, worries around issues like immigration, um, worries about communities and people who are left behind by globalization, deal with those issues, and then create a new agenda of change, which is radical change, but still sensible and evidence-based. Otherwise, I think what will happen is that a populism of left and of right will go into fierce conflict with each other. And both of these types of populism are good at riding the anger, but they're bad at providing the answer. And I want the answer, not the anger. Um, switching now from the governmental to the individual perspective, we can see different reactions in society uh, to populism by accepting it, challenging it, or ignoring populism. How should we as individuals and as society cope with that? Well, it depends what you think are the problems, <laughs> I guess. Uh, look, it's, the most important thing is to realize we, we're living in an era of profound change. Now, I personally think the single biggest change that's coming towards us is the new technological revolution. Right? This is the thing that's going to change the way we live, the way we work, the way we think. It's going to change everything. It's like the 19th century industrial revolution. So this is the 21st century equivalent. And my view is what we should be concentrating on as political leaders and as people, whether you're running a university or a business, whatever you're doing, you should be concentrating on how you handle the implications of that technological revolution. Because it will, it will provide enormous benefits at one level, and at another level, it's going to have a big disruptive effect. So it will change the way people work, so it may displace jobs. It's changing, for example, social media has revolutionized politics. Okay. So in every area, you're going to have to handle this process of change. Now, that's what I would like to see people concentrating on. And, you know, the technology is right at the heart of it. I should say that my, my children um, always advise me not to talk about technology in public. Um, <laughs> because they say they have a large amount of accumulated evidence that I don't understand it. And, <laughs> and in truth, I don't understand a lot of it, but I do understand its importance. So uh, if we focus now on the UK, um, were such populistic developments or more the change um, that were the main reasons for Brexit? Yeah, so I think Brexit was driven by feelings that actually are not just British. I think you can see the same anxieties across Europe. It's just that we had a referendum. Okay. Um, so immigration is definitely a real issue for people because look, I, I believe that immigration is a positive for society, but I think you have to have controls and structure around it. Otherwise, people feel that you're changing their world and their society without their consent and without their control. So that's one issue. Another issue, as I say, is deindustrialization, usually through technology, where some people can handle this change and some people can't. So there's a lot of worry about that. The financial crisis meant that there was a lot of, you know, post-financial crisis, a lot of dissatisfaction, anxiety, stagnating living standards. I mean, if you think what the Eurozone has gone through in these past 10 years, you know, it's not surprising that people feel worried and anxious. Um, and then finally, I think there are anxieties about whether we lose our national identity as we cooperate more in Europe. So I think it's a, it's a, 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 a set of things that in one way or another, 
even though they may be very pronounced in the UK, I think they are still problems across Europe. And I think, you know, if you look back in the last two years in Europe, European politics has also undergone a change. So this is, I think, what is, what's happening, and the question is what we de how, we, how we deal with it. So um, we're talking a lot about emotions, about feelings right now, and considering this, that uh, referendums, for example, the Brexit, um, the people are deciding on a highly emotional level. Um, does it make sense to let citizens decide on such important matters, or is it maybe better to hand over uh, the decision to an elective of the state? <laughs> so, it's, look, this, it's an unwise politician who tells you that you shouldn't let the people make the decision. <laughs> okay. um, truthfully, I, look, I was opposed to the referendum being held. Um, and just, it's a matter of interest, really, but, and nothing more, but in 2015, we had a general election in the UK, which David Cameron won with a majority, and Europe was barely an issue. In fact, I think I made the only speech in that election campaign, and that was about Europe saying a referendum was not a good idea. Then 2016, we have the referendum, it's such a huge decision, it's, it's difficult to do it like this, but anyway, we've done it. And the last 30 months, 32 months, have been an education about what Brexit really means. And this is why it's still now, today, I think very uncertain as to what will happen in the UK, and it changes almost day by day. I mean, look, I am, I should make a, uh, an honest confession at the beginning. I am completely opposed to Brexit. Uh, I think it is um, a terrible historic mistake for my country and I will do everything I can until the last moment <laughs> to stop it. But there it is. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, as I said, and most of us know you're a supporter, a great supporter of the second referendum. How can you explain the need of a second referendum without destroying the trust in British politics? So, I find this a sort of strange argument because, you know, when we made the Brexit decision, it's like deciding to move house, but you haven't yet seen the new house. Right. Now, you may decide you want out of your old house, but most of us would not move to the new house till we'd seen it. And then when we see it, if what was promised turns out to be, shall we say, less than 100% accurate, <laughs> is it unreasonable to say, no, I think I'd like to change my mind about that? So what I find extraordinary is that people say it's undemocratic when we've had 30 odd months, two and a half years, as you said, of negotiation, the one thing everyone's agreed is the thing's a complete mess, right? It's undemocratic to go back and ask the people whether in these circumstances they want to proceed. I mean, we're asking the people, the British people, right? we're not asking some other people. So I don't understand how it's undemocratic. And the truth is, it's entirely sensible once we've been through all of this, and once we know what we're being offered, to ask the British people to confirm that we want to leave or to say, well, actually, on reflection, what we have is better. And I don't really, so I'm, I am continuing to be a passionate supporter of going back to the people and asking them this. And I think this is, look, I think there would be a case for doing this anyway, but the case is pretty strong when we've had this period of negotiation that's turned into a, 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 a waking nightmare, when the Prime Minister herself has been subject to a vote of confidence in Parliament, a vote of confidence in her own party, her own deal has been voted down heavily in the House of Commons, you know, it's not unreasonable to ask the people who took the original decision, do you still want to proceed? And, I still think this is an argument that can be won, by the way. 
So if we think about it, there might be a second referendum. What do you think would be the outcome of a second referendum? I think people would vote to stay, but I think, you know, that's obviously to be decided. And if they vote to leave, then that's it for me. You know, I, <laughs> then I say, okay, we go along with it because we have to. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's sensible just before we take this irrevocable decision that is going to affect future generations that we have a final think um. and then final say. Uh, and I, as I say, I think when you really think about it rationally, on a decision of this magnitude, isn't it sensible to do that? To say to people, okay, you've seen what a, you've seen the, all the, you know, we know much more about everything. Look, I was prime minister for 10 years. I know more about the single market, the customs union, the different aspects of this than I did. So if I, even I have had my knowledge enlarged, I should think most people, they know a lot more about it today than they did then. And this again is all part of the, I would say, fight of reason against this sort of populist, you know, we've taken a decision, it doesn't matter what the evidence is about it, we're just going to proceed. Uh, considering um, that um, a second referendum might turn out um, against the Brexit, um, do you fear that this outcome will split the nation? The nation is split. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that, and I really am. And that's why, you know, for someone like me, what I say is it would be best if we stayed in Europe, but if Europe also recognized that some of the British anxieties are European-wide anxieties and made an offer of reform, not just for Britain, but for Europe. So I, I would do everything I could to reach out to those people who voted for Brexit and try and bring some of them over to our side of the argument. But, Sylvia, the, the point is we are divided. Um, and yes, it's true, if we reverse this decision, it will provoke um, anger amongst certain people. But if we continue in these circumstances and we leave in this way, there will also be anger on the other side of the debate. So I think there's no, my view is the only way you can bring closure to this now is to have the debate based on what we now know and settle the issue once and for all. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, the UK has been negotiating for a very long time now, and uh, without wanting to judge it, and you also mentioned it, um, that uh, there's, there has never been such a great defeat in the results than May's withdrawal agreement. If you would have been in May's position, would you have resigned? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't think the issue really is her resignation because I don't think that particularly solves anything. Um, and by the way, you know, I've done the job of prime minister, so I know how difficult it is. And if it weren't for the fact that this issue, I think is more important than any other we've debated in my lifetime in the UK, and if it weren't for the, you know, the, the importance of it to Britain's future, I wouldn't be in this debate. I think, by and large, it's best that, you know, former prime ministers keep out of it. But if I had been in her position, I think what I would have wanted to do is to outline for people the options and to try and educate the country about what those options are and then facilitate a consensus or at least an agreement with the majority. And the real problem is that, in the end, the, the difficulty, the challenge Britain faces is a very simple one. For 45 years, we've been members of the European Union. During that time, we have helped create the single market, the customs union. We've been part of that European trading system. Companies have come and invested in the UK. Uh, because we're part of that system. Companies in the UK have been exporting into that European market as part of that preferential trading system. So all of these commercial investment, 
trading relationships have grown up over that time. So here's the dilemma, and it's a very simple one. You either decide that because of all these relationships and because of the damage to your economy, you will stay close to Europe right, and therefore keep within the trading system. So this is where Norway is, by the way. So Norway is outside of the European Union, but it's part of the single market. Okay. Or alternatively, you decide, no, I want out of this European trading system, and you become a normal third country like Canada has just signed a free trade agreement with Europe. Okay. So these are the two options. You can have a close relationship, a more distant one. But the trouble with the more distant one is because of all this time you've spent within the European trading system, you break it up, it's going to be damaging. It's going to be very economically difficult. So for example, London is the financial center for the single currency, but we're not part of the single currency. We can do that because we're part of the single market. You know, BMW, very familiar name here, <laughs> BMW Mini is now the new company. That name describes to you, the Mini was the archetypal British car, right? It has now a very good partnership, BMW Mini, great. But BMW Mini has created on the basis it remains part of that European system. So the point is, when you leave it, you're going to do damage. So if you're part of the first system, the Norway system, then you leave Europe, but you still keep to its rules. So all you've done is lose your place at the table, making the rules. That's what I call the pointless Brexit. Or alternatively, you break out and you do your own thing, but that causes a lot of damage. That's what I call the painful Brexit. So you've got pointless versus painful. And all the way through this negotiation, the problem is that the British government has been trying to create a negotiation which gives us the benefits of Norway and the freedom of Canada. It was never going to work. And it hasn't. So if I was prime minister, I would be saying, those are the choices. Those are the honest choices. You either decide this freedom, which I think is largely mythical, but OK, this freedom to make all of your own laws is so important you're prepared to have the economic damage. Or you say, no, no, I'll, I, I've got to remain part of that European system. So what's the point? What's the price? This is the dilemma. And it literally can't be got round. So I think if we, so just to finish the point, what the Prime Minister's deal now does is it leaves open the future relationship, which is, in my view, its profound weakness. And by the way, for Europe, it's the profound weakness. So we have a withdrawal agreement, but the future relationship is unresolved. Is it close, like Norway? Is it distant, like Canada? This is a big mistake for both of us. Because even if she were to get her deal through, in a year's time, we're still going to be arguing about the same thing. So that's why, if I was Prime Minister, I would be trying to lay it all out for people, tell people these are the options, and then hopefully guide them to a better position for the future of my country. So you already told us a bit about the economic perspective, but um, there's also another point, uh, another big issue with the Brexit negotiations is the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. What are possible options to solve this issue? Right, so the Irish issue is really a microcosm of the issue I've just described. But the reason it's so difficult now is because Ireland and the Irish issue is part of the withdrawal agreement. Okay. So you've got to have clarity about that now. Whereas with the future relationship, you could leave it vague. So the Irish border is very simple. When um, the European common market was created, when Europe and the beginnings of the European Union happened, Britain was outside, Ireland was outside, the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland was created around about 100 years ago, when the island of Ireland was split. Northern Ireland stayed with the UK, 
the South became its own country, Republic of Ireland, right? We then joined Europe on the same day in 1973. So always we have been in the same relationship to Europe, Northern Ireland in the UK, Republican of Ireland, separate country. But we've always been together in Europe or out of Europe together. For the first time, the border with the European Union is going to be that border between North and South and Ireland. So it's a microcosm of the same thing. Everybody agrees, partly because of the Good Friday Agreement, which my government negotiated, which created the peace um, in, agreement in Northern Ireland. We all agree that border's got to remain open because it's a 200-mile border. There are families with members of the family on either side of the border. It's always been open. So everyone agrees with that. But once it becomes the border, external border of the European Union, then if Northern Ireland is in a different relationship to the trading system of Europe than the Republic, then that border becomes a hard border. Okay. It's pretty obvious. So the problem is, again, what we are saying is, no, we want that border to remain completely open, but we want Northern Ireland out of the single market and customs union, and in addition, we want Northern Ireland in the same relationship to Europe as the rest of the UK. So it doesn't work. So this is why, so what the Europeans have said is, okay, fine, we're going to agree to keep Ireland in a customs union. The British say yes, but only temporarily, and until we find some technological device that allows us to make this border not necessary. And the Europeans say, sure, but just in case this technology doesn't materialize, we'll have a guarantee that you stay in the customs union until we agree that this technological solution is available. And this is the point of difficulty at the moment because, again, what we want is both the open border and out of the single market and customs union. So it's uh, the Irish, but the Irish problem is just the whole trading problem, writ, you know, writ small. And afterwards, uh, if we leave in this way, we're just going to be debating the Irish question, but for the whole of the UK. So, uh, look, it gets pretty complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize for that, but in the end, you know, the most important thing is we had decades, if not centuries, of conflict on the island of Ireland. We finally got peace. We actually were both doing extremely well within Europe, so why on earth put the thing at risk now? <laughs> That's what I say. I mean, it's just... Anyway, let's hope we don't. <laughs> Um, you surely mentioned also Europe um, in this topic and um, imagining you were, for example, Mr. Juncker, the president of the European Commission. How would you handle this topic in his position? Is there something you can do to relax the situation? Eh? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Uh, I mean, the, the trouble is, is, as you will know in your own politics, the Europeans are in a very difficult position because they kind of, you know, I don't know how familiar you are with the British media, but let's say a part of it is somewhat Eurosceptic. And so, you know, any European or someone who's non-British who comes in to the politics of the UK, it's, you know, you're, you're treading a minefield. So it's very difficult, but basically, the European Commission set out the options right at the very beginning, and they've been pretty consistent with those options all the way through. I mean, look, the other thing I think that gets lost, though, about Europe is, you know, you can look at this in just economic terms, but in my view, there's a big, big political reason for Europe today. You know, one of the things that happens when you've stopped being prime minister, um, apart from the fact that it's less stressful, um, is that you go out in the world and you, you learn a lot. Uh, and it's actually rather shocking to me how much I've learned since I stopped being prime minister. Um, I really think I should have known all that when I was doing the job. But the way I see the world right now is quite stark. I think by the middle of this century, 
you're going to have three giants in the world. China, United States of America, probably India. And these giants will be larger than any other nations by a long way. And their economies are going to be several times the size of the next group of players. And those next group are going to be the tall countries, right? Japan, Brazil, probably with population, Indonesia, maybe Russia. You know. So these countries, Mexico, these countries are going to be tall, but nowhere near the size of the giants. And then you're going to have the medium-sized countries. That's going to be Britain and France and Germany and Italy. Now, in this world, if we don't come together and band together, we're going to get flattened by the giants. So if we want to sit at the same table as those giants on equal terms, we've got to be together as Europe. Right? And it's the only way we're going to defend our interests, but also our values. Because the other thing that's going to happen with this century is that power is going to shift east. And right now, the biggest repository of that power, which is China, has not just got a different political system from us, it's making a virtue of its different political system. It's saying, the way you guys do it in the West is not the way to do it. Well, for all its faults, I quite like our way of life. Okay. So if we want to defend these values and interests, we've got to be together. And that's the reason for Europe. The reason of my father's generation was peace after the, the ruins of the Second World War. Right? That was the reason for Europe then, peace. The rationale for Europe today is power. Without coming together collectively, individually, we're not strong enough. So that's why you need Europe today. And it's not just about economics, it's about politics and it's about defending essential European values. So. As I said, it's very important that we find back together which actions uh, of the European Union are necessary to win back the Britons. So I think there are two, to put it very directly, I think there are two groups of issues. One around immigration, which is partly about, as Europe is now doing, strengthening the external borders of Europe, partly about the abuse of freedom of movement of workers, because I think there are instances in Europe today, and I think this has happened in the last decade, where you know, people will sometimes import labor in order to undercut wages and terms and conditions of employment. Um, I think you know, people need to protect the integrity of their welfare systems. Um, I think there are a series of reforms consistent with the freedom of movement principle that we could bring in that would help the immigration question. And then I think, um, I think as many European politicians understand today, those countries in the Eurozone are going to integrate differently and more deeply than those outside. And I think acknowledging the fact that you will have to a degree a multi-speed Europe is a perfectly sensible thing. And there'll be some countries that want to be fully part of the Eurozone and so on, and there will some countries who won't. But being part of that European family is still important. So I think there, there are a set of reforms, and I think if we showed the British people that we had listened to the, their concerns, and actually the concerns all over Europe, I think it would strengthen British, the British response, but I also think it would strengthen Europe, because you know, your politics is also being turned upside down. You know, I think I think I'm right in saying that the combined level of support for the SDP now and the, the, the CDU is less than it's been, I think, for a long time at least, uh, maybe ever. Um, if you look at France, you see a politics in a state of bouleversement. If you look at Italy and what's happened, you know, the Five Star Movement and Nord Liga, um, you know, you look at what's happening virtually in any country in Europe today, politics is is undergoing these revolutionary strains. So I think it's really important that the European leaders grip this situation, 
not just to please the British, as it were, but also to deal with European-wide concerns. Thank you very much. Um, I want to continue now with a personal question before I will hand over the, quest uh, the questions to the audience. Um, when was the moment in your political career when you really understood what power means? The day I left, I think. <laughs> 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 No, actually, I mean, it's, it's one, of the, look, one of the strange things about politics is that you, you, the journey of politics is essentially that you begin at your most popular and least capable, and you end uh, at your least popular and most capable. Um, and, you know, the business of governing is, is, is difficult, and I, I remember when we won that, landslide victory in 1997 and you know everybody was celebrating and I was just thinking all the time you know my god this is now real okay because in opposition you can just blah 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 basically and you know you could do it well or you can do it badly but what matters is what you say when you get into government it's what you do and the skills that bring you to power, which are often skills to do with persuasion and communication, when you actually sit in the seat of government, <laughs> it's, you're more like a chief executive. Then it's skills of implementation and detail and policy and focus. So I took some time to, to learn this, very frankly. I mean, I remember after about a year in government, I was very conscious of the fact that I was learning all the time. And so I wanted to go out and make a speech and say to the British people, look, hey, I'm just learning this. <laughs> My press people said, no, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> Everyone's going to panic. You know? And one of the absurdities of politics is you've got to, you know, you, you've got to pretend that you know the answer to everything. Now, I know politicians become very adept at talking about things they know nothing about, but it's even so, you know, this is the, this is the, and you realize then as you start to do that, that each of your decisions affects people's lives and can affect them in a really very real and direct way. So, yeah, that's the way it is. Thank you very much for a very <laughs> personal insight. When we shared this event on social media, we also asked for interesting questions. And uh, we had uh, one question uh, on Instagram, which became quite popular. And uh, I want here now hand over the questions to the audience. And we have one long, young lady sitting here. Um, and uh, you can raise your hand shortly. So we have some yeah, guys around here with the microphone. Uh, you're welcome to ask a question. Yeah. Dear Mr. Tony Blair, first of all, thank you for this wonderful speech. My name is Erdina Zicire. I'm originally from Kosovo, and I'm pursuing my studies in economics and public policy at a master level. My question for you is as follows. Uh, I want to ask something regarding the European army, which our German Chancellor Angela Merkel endorsed a lot. Mr. Farage came out by replying to the statement that this makes him even happier to be leaving the EU. I want to know what your point of view is regarding a U European army, and do you think that this might be an additional incentive for a Brexit? Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, I think probably I'd best not give you my views on Mr. Farage. Um, but, <laughs> uh, so, you see, the European defense concept actually was started uh, by a summit between myself and President Chirac back in the year 2000. And it's really a very important issue because one of the things that I think is vital for Europe to develop in the future is proper defense capability. And we should do that not because we want to be half-hearted about NATO. NATO is an essential part of our defense, as people in Kosovo would know very well. 
Um, but because we will face challenges on our doorstep, and presently we are frankly completely reliant on the United States of America. So when we did the action in Kosovo, when I was uh, prime minister, still the vast proportion of the assets came from the US. And yet, if you put it together, what we spend in Europe and the armed forces and the capabilities we have, it makes perfect sense for us to fashion greater European defense cooperation. Now, when we use the term European army, sometimes what that does is it gets misrepresented in certain places, as if you're literally jamming a whole lot of people who speak different languages <laughs> with different chains of command together in one, in one jumble. This is not what it means. What it means is, however, looking at how we can pool our defense capabilities in the most effective way. For example, one of the things that my institute does is work um, in Africa, and at the moment we're particularly focused on the Sahel group of countries. That's that band of countries across the north part of sub-Saharan Africa, where you've got exploding populations, um, dire poverty, radicalization, and extremism. We may well face the next wave of migration and extremism from those countries. It makes perfect sense for Europe to have the military capability to help those countries with their security. So this is where I think, you know, European defense capability should go. So my view is that if we explain this properly, no, it doesn't help the Brexit case. But sometimes people, you know, you can use the phrase European army without defining it in a way that, you know, people think suddenly, you know, the UK armed forces are going to be taken over by, I don't know, um, Luxembourg or something. I mean, it's, you know, so this is, so we just need to be careful how we do this. But this is, you know, one of the other things for Europe is just, and look, I know this, I went through not just Kosovo, but obviously post 9-11, Afghanistan, Iraq, very, very difficult decisions, very difficult around our relationship with the United States of America, very divisive questions still today. But I came to the conclusion that though this transatlantic alliance with America is extremely important and we need to maintain it, the best partnership is a partnership where we have our own capabilities that are also strong. And this is why I think the concept of European defense and greater European defense cooperation is absolutely essential for the future, for Britain and for the rest of Europe. So the rest of you is now welcome to ask questions. Just raise your hand. I think we have one guy just there on the right in the red sweater, yes. Um, Mr. Blair, thank you for your wonderful speech. Um, I have one question regarding misinformation. Um, prior to the Brexit referendum, there was something which many of us got to know as the um, NHS, NHS buses. And if you had been in the Prime Minister's office prior to the referendum, how much can you actually do to fight misinformation and what steps um, do you think a democracy can take to fight misinformation without actually going too far? Yes, again, it's a very good question. I mean, you know, people make all sorts of claims when they're campaigning and you've got to be careful because one person's disinformation is another person's legitimate political claim. Um, so I think there are two different questions here. One is what we do about organized disinformation campaigns. So, for example, when a foreign country tries to interfere in electoral processes, as I think has happened to a degree in many European countries um, over these past few years, there I think you've got to expose it, um, defeat it, work on how you make sure through regulation that doesn't happen. Um, but I think that's a separate challenge all in itself. You know, the claim on the NHS, I mean, I just think we needed to counter it better than we did. But I think we needed to counter it in two ways. One, 
was to say, because the 350 million pounds, I don't know if people remember this, but on the, the, the bus of the Brexit campaign was, if you vote for Brexit, what they took is the contributions that Britain makes to the European Union, and then divide them by the weeks of the year and say, this money is gonna be saved when we're out of Europe, and then we give it all to the NHS. Okay. Now, it has turned out, again, as I might say, less than accurate. Uh, in fact, it's absolutely clear because our growth rates are down as a result of Brexit that we're gonna have less money to spend on the NHS, not more money. But I think we should also have done a better job of explaining why the wealthy countries make contributions into the EU. Because it's mainly now to help those countries in Eastern Europe develop. And this is sensible. This is a wise investment. And by the way, it comes to the net contributions that Britain makes to the EU are around about 1% or less of public spending. So the idea that you know, we've got these vast sums of money, I mean, the Prime Minister even now talks about these vast sums of money going to Europe. I mean, eight billion pounds sounds a lot of money and is a lot of money, except in the context of an overall budget. But anyway, the, the, the point that we should be making is, when we make these contributions, we help those countries develop. As they develop, they become more prosperous. As they become more prosperous, they trade more. As they trade more, the living standards of their people go up. This is in our interest. So, for example, in 2004, when Poland joined uh, the European Union, the annual trade between the UK and Poland was less than 4 billion. Today, it's roughly 15 billion. An amount additional, by the way, each year that's more than the entirety of the contributions we make to the EU budget. So, I think we should have been sharper and better at knocking down that claim, but we should also have been explaining why it's not wrong that the wealthy countries help those that are less wealthy to develop, because in the end, in that collective spirit of solidarity, we all end up better off, and that is actually the best principle and value of Europe. We have one guy here in the blue T-shirt. Hello, Mr. Blair. Um, over this entire evening, you have been very sympathetic and humane in the way that you give answers. You admit to sometimes not knowing exactly everything or the uh, detail of the subject that has come up. up. Um, and to me, the question now is that, do we sometimes lack the humane aspect when diplomats come together and decide upon big issues such as Brexit? Do we therefore increase the fear that has come up in the, uh, in the broad um, public? Aren't we, aren't we fueling the fire that has already been going on? And also, what details aren't we talking about? Because obviously, you professionals have a much deeper insight on what the issue is? What does the broad public not know? Yeah, yeah these, are, these are all really interesting and good questions, and that, that is a very good question. So here's the weird thing about politics. I mean, I had a conversation with someone uh, a couple of months back, and I was explaining to them about the single market, customs union, the different Norway, Canada, all that. And the guy, I, I could see I was going nowhere with him. And he says to me, um, well, you're just trying to pretend to me that you know far more about this than I do. And I said, yeah, I was prime minister for 10 years. If I don't know more about this than you do. And then I could see him thinking, well, this is very elitist of you. But it's common sense. Look. I, I hesitate to talk about football in this city, <laughs> since I'm probably about to lose the entire audience now. I am not, but my wife and um, two of my children are firm Liverpool supporters. But um, So I'm a Newcastle supporter. Just, <laughs> uh, and I watch the games. 
You know, if they're on TV, I watch them. I read about them. I'm interested in football. But I know that our football coach, our manager, Rafa Benitez, has forgotten more about football in one day than I will ever know in my whole life. Now, that's not because he's smarter than me. Well, he probably is smarter than me, but it's because that's his job. And why try and say to people about politics? Politics is no different. So those MPs who are at the moment studying things in Parliament and the detail, that's their job. That's what they're supposed to do. The diplomats you send off, as you <laughs> imply in your question, they, that's what they're supposed to do. So we've got to get into a relationship between people who, who govern and those that are governed by them, which is more honest about you know, where we all stand. Because this is part of the problem with today's social media. I mean, look, social media is in many ways a great thing, but it's also, let me, let's be clear, in politics, it's a bit of a plague. Because everyone thinks they've got an opinion, and they think their opinion is as valid as anyone else's opinion, whether it is or it isn't type thing. So you end up in a situation where, of course, the detail of all of this is not something that people are going to get into. And that's really why you send people to Parliament or to the Bundestag. You send them there because that's their day job. They should be focusing on that all the time. And really, we need to get into a much more honest conversation about this. And so what I say to people is, is look, of course, I'm not suggesting in the end, you know, the public are in charge because they decide the government. And the public will have strong views on particular issues. But it's really important we understand that there's nothing elitist about saying that people who spend their entire life studying something are going to know more about it than people who don't. It applies in any walk of life. And you know, funnily enough, it applies in politics too. Other, and then you get this, because if you don't take this common sense position, you get into this thing where people say, oh, all these politicians, that, you know, in a democracy, you guys elect us. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, it's a self-criticism in the end. If we're all dumb and bad, you know, you should be electing someone else. But what you do when you create this thing around politics and you create this vibe that all politicians are cheats and liars and frauds is then the biggest cheats and liars and frauds come along and exploit you to get elected. That's actually what happens. And right around the Western world today, that is what we're in danger of. So we have uh, one last question uh, to be asked, and uh, we unfortunately run out of time. Um, <laughs> I just go back there in the. Or do you do you want to pick somebody? No, no. Here. <laughs> no, because also you always get into this thing trying to describe people. You know how they're dressed or what they look like, and then you can get into a world of trouble. <laughs> then we go just here on the last row. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Blair, for the, your insightful answers. I would like to ask you, as a Scottish man, what do you think is going to happen with Scotland after the Brexit? Is it going to happen another referendum regarding the Scottish independence? And how is going to be the deal uh, between Scotland and Europe if uh, the UK actually leaves uh, the European Union? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, look, I hope Scotland remains part of the UK. Obviously, Scotland voted heavily to stay in Europe. This is causing tension between Scotland and, uh, and England. I think if, if we do a Brexit that is a hard Brexit, so we, we actually get out of the European trading system, this is gonna be a problem. Yeah, it will be a problem that will cause, so quite apart from the UK's relationship with Europe, the UK is also putting strain on its own relationship internally. So this is, you know, this is also a problem. So I hope that we can find a way to keep the UK together, but I think it's much easier to do that um, uh, within Europe. I mean, Scotland's got a very close relationship with England, obviously, in trading and economic terms, so I think Scotland will 
always want to remain close to, to England, but you know, a large number of Scots want to be part of Europe too. And by the way, so do a large number of young people in the whole of the UK. I mean, one of the really interesting things is that two thirds of the people over 65 voted to leave, and two thirds of those under the age of 35 voted to stay. So this is, you know, this is a, this is also why people say the vote might be different today because, <laughs> but, but this is, so somewhat, so that's a, that is, <laughs> That is a morbid reflection, uh, which we will d develop no further. But anyway, for all these reasons, uh, I hope very much we do find it in, in our minds and in our hearts to stay. Um, I would like to say in, in conclusion also just to thank you all very much for having me here, um, to say that I am a proud um, Brit. I'm very proud of my country, very proud of Britain, but I believe in today's world there is nothing wrong with being a proud Brit and proud to be part of the European Union at the same time. Thank you very much. Thank you for being our guest tonight. I think we all enjoyed a great talk. Thank you for that. As a gift, I want to present you a brew barrel, which <laughs> is from a Tum startup. So you, it's a do-it-yourself kit for brewing your own beer. And I hope wow. you will enjoy it. Thanks. Thank you. I certainly will. Thank you. <laughs>